All right, well, that's the end of the intro, I suppose. What up, gangsters? I'm Jack. Behind me is the green screen, joined by Gold King, and uh, this Hello. is this is press start. Really, not a lot of really not a, a lot of work goes into the, the the setup for this. All we do is we start a, a dialogue about news articles that I covered at the beginning of the week, things in the gaming world that need to be covered by people that are involved in the podcast. If you want to be involved in the conversation, join the Discord with the Discord information below. And uh, we'll get you in here and make you part of the conversation. This is a Dead Mouse jersey, in case you're wondering. It's all nice and purple, and I like the color. Eat shit, don't tell me how to dress. So, uh, the first story we have is that Valve is apologizing for the Steam trouble during Christmas. And here is the link in chat, and here is the link in press start. Have a look at that. After almost a week of silence, Valve has issued an apology for the leak of private user information on Steam that took place just prior to Christmas, along with an explanation of what went wrong. The problem, which affected approximately 34,000 users, was the result of a caching error that arose out of a denial of service attack against Steam. So, Valve got dust. That's... That's pretty, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Uh, as a, a quote, early Christmas morning, Pacific Standard Time, the Steam store was a target of a DOS attack which prevented the serving of store pages to users. Attacks against Steam store and Steam in general are regular occurrence that Valve handles both directly and with the help of partner companies. And typically do not impact Steam users. During a Christmas attack, traffic to the Steam store increased 2,000% over average traffic during the Steam sale, Valve explained in a statement posted on Steam. And that statement is right here. Get this opened up here for you. Oh, I have it opened up. I'm just reading through it right now. Yeah. Oh, wait. Well, okay, so, yeah, that's... That's a hyperlink in itself. In response to this specific attack, caching rules managed by a Steam web caching partner were deployed in order to both minimize the impact on Steam store servers and continue to route legitimate user traffic. During the second wave of this attack, a second caching configuration was deployed that incorrectly cached web traffic for authentication for authenticated users. This configuration error resulted in some users seeing Steam Steam store responses which were generated for other users. Incorrect store responses varied from users seeing the front page of the store displayed in the wrong language to seeing the account page of another user. So basically, the Steam servers had a hard time keeping track of who was looking at what at what time. Which was the, the source of the whole problem, which was the, the, the crux of it all. And this, is, this was in the midst of implementing a new system. Yeah, implementing a new system in the middle of the, the Steam Christmas sales. Like, shit just got crazy. Yeah, damn. Well, I mean, it's a good thing that they kind of caught it relatively soon. I mean, 34,000 is still a lot of people. But yeah, it is. For an, online, uh, for an online thing like Steam, I wouldn't say that's like... That's probably maybe a, a, a percent, if not a fraction of a percent of their entire user base. Right. It is. They they did come forward. They did state that this was a problem, and uh, you know they didn't try to hide it as far as, far as I can tell. They didn't try to hide it. No, I what I think the the reason for the long response after this particular attack or these these pair of attacks is that they needed to find a way to word it properly, like to get all their information together and get it to their public relations guy and say, okay, word this in such a way where we don't look like the enemy, and they're not because you. I, Security is only so good, right? If somebody wants to break your system, they're going to break your system. That's that's all there is to it. Uh, people oh, yeah. boycotted Sony after the the break into the PSN, and people boycotted Microsoft after the the break in for the Xbox Live servers and all of those users' private information. And I mean, it, it bothers me that, that I'm I'm speaking to some people on Skype and even on Discord uh, more recently in the last week that have said, you know, the news story you 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 covered about Steam saying sorry or Valve saying sorry isn't enough. They should have been more secure. Well, how much more fucking secure do you think it needs to be if this is the first reported issue that I've had in the last five years of, of being a Steam user? I mean, for five years, if this is the only thing that's happened, and I wasn't even around, I was uh, at Christmas break with some family members. Um, if this is the only issue that people have come across in the last five years, 
I, I would say Valve is doing pretty well for themselves. Hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. It says, uh, the leaked information varied by page requests, but included users' billing address, the last four digits of Steam Guard phone number, purchase history, and the last two digits of credit card numbers and or email addresses. Okay, full credit card numbers, passwords, or enough data to allow logging in as or completing a transaction as another user were not included among the caching requests. So even so, even when they had these problems, even when they had these things, it was it probably wasn't even enough for another user to say randomly get this other user's page just accidentally and even with that they wouldn't be able to get all of their information right all they would be able to see is general information you wouldn't be able to see the complete phone number you wouldn't be able to see the complete credit card number but people still bitched about it uh, let's see and users who weren't browsing the Steam sword during that specific time frame were not affected. So, there were some people that, that if you weren't looking at the Steam sword at that particular time, it didn't even affect you. It didn't yeah. even, you didn't even notice a difference. So, uh, Valve said it is continuing to work with the involved web caching partner to identify users impacted by the leak and improve its processes to ensure this doesn't happen again. We apologize to everyone whose personal information was exposed by this error and for interrupting the Steam Store service. So what are you going to do? Are you going to order a pizza and have it delivered somewhere at this particular address? I don't I don't understand. Okay, yeah, my uh, they're going to get my billing address. They're going to walk up to my front door, knock on it, and probably get shot in the face. I mean, <laughs> sorry, you don't... No. Welcome to USA. Well, welcome to Texas. <laughs> so, the user's billing address, the last four of their, their phone number, their purchase history, and the last two digits of their credit card number and or email address. Cool. Here's the fucking have my email address. I don't care. Do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Well, th well, this... I wouldn't say do whatever you want. They'll sell it to spammers. <laughs> Even though... Well, I will. I don't know about some spammers. Do people? Are there even people out there that will buy email addresses yes. just to spam them? Yes. Mass caching. It's a. It's a pretty standard practice. They were talking about doing it with Facebook. Uh, they did it with MySpace right before Facebook got released, and that's why people left MySpace, or one of the many reasons people left MySpace. Um, and people are like, oh, well, my billing address and the last two or four digits of my phone number have been released to whoever wanted to see it. Well, here's here's the thing with the, the digital age. Anybody that wants your address can find it. They can do a, a, a search oh, yeah. on Google for your name and your city and get a, a rundown of all your information. Private investigators these days use internet searches to find people. It's not that hard. You can get last known addresses, names of family members and associates. You can even get somebody's registered phone number out of fucking Google if you wanted to. So, bitching about somebody, it's its its the ease of use versus privacy thing. Things are going to become more, more user friendly. Things are going to become, you know, are going to have a lot more easy buttons registered, you know, or attached to them. You push an easy button, you push an easy button. Well, for that, the trade off for that is privacy. You need to remove some of your privacy in order to make things marginally easier for you over time. And oh, yeah, the, the same thing can be said for cell phones, the same thing can be said for, you know, Facebook profiles and Twitter and MySpace and, and any kind of social media outlet at all. Anything you post on any website ever can be tracked back to you. E everything. Everything. You log on to the internet, that's an IP address, and somebody with a warrant or some kind of... of, of court ordered whatever could go to your ISP and say okay at this date at this time on, sorry, on this date at this time who is this IP address registered to and the ISP can give the account of the person who who had that that IP address so I mean it's somebody who really wants your information is gonna get it regardless of whether or not there's a damn steam leak here Yeah, I mean, quite honestly, that is really true. And I will say that, given a lot of what you're saying, I can definitely say that most of it is true. Um, 
If, well, if not all of it is true, because I've actually been taking uh, classes that deal with information science studies and information science ethics, and we cover you know, these exact same topics about how the more technology is going to go forward, the more sort of privacy we're going to need to give up. We need to be able to you know, trust providers like Google to keep our privacy safe, because there's a whole ethical issue when it comes to that. That um, large data providers like Google, uh, you know, sometimes have to face the question of, okay, are we like say, say you know, if a if the police come to them, they want information about a certain user. Would it be ethical for them to hand over that information or maintain their privacy because you know, they're Google, so they do know what you search. Etc. Etc. There's definitely all sorts of situations where it's uh, what they're doing about your privacy as well, um, and what their own policies are. So sometimes, you know, giving up that privacy will be a big deal. Sometimes not as much. It really all depends on who you're giving it up for for that ease of access and that you know, easy way to uh, just make things easier for ourselves. Well, it's like on, on Steam, right? You can have Steam save your credit card information for future purchases if that's what you really want to do. If somebody gets access to your account, they can buy themselves a gift copy of whatever game with your credit card because it's saved there. I mean, it's, it's like we've been discussing, ease of use versus privacy. There's some ratio there that I'm sure some uh, number crunchers will be able to figure out, but since I'm not one of them, Oh, let's see here. Are you familiar at all with uh, with MLG, Gold King? MLG? Yeah, MLG, Major League Gaming. Yeah, Major League, yeah. You know that uh, Activision slash Blizzard bought them up for uh, $46 million, right? Yeah. I thought, ML I thought MLG was just a thing. I didn't know it was a corporation. Yeah, MLG is... Yeah. is MLG is what the esports league, uh, sorry, the esports league is what MLG should have been, and MLG got released with. Um, there, there were some tournaments sponsored by, you know, and and the the meme of Mountain Dew and Doritos being the MLG thing is actually quite accurate, because Mountain Dew and Doritos have both sponsored MLG tournaments, and it was like Halo and Call of Duty and Battlefield and and other random shooters. And the eSports League uh, opened it up to fighters, uh, you know, fighting games and racing games and strategy games and, and you know, League of Legends and, uh, you know, MOBAs and things like that. So uh, MLG kind of went by the wayside. And MLG originally, what, what they wanted to do was have it hosted on ESPN and it worked for a little while. And then there was no more, there wasn't as much support or feedback as they were expecting or positive feedback as they were expecting from putting MLG on TV. And it went back to not being a thing. And the esports league uh, up and comer popped in and said, "Hey, we're going to do all of this on Twitch TV and through other streaming networks, and we're going to make uh, internet gaming tournaments a big thing." And they did, and and they made it a huge success. So with Activision being the company behind Call of Duty now, it's pretty safe to say that MLG is going to return with a heavy emphasis on Call of Duty and. To my understanding, they're aiming to put it on TV. They're aiming to put MLG back on TV. And I had a conversation with, with Bob, uh, our, our GTA homie, not too long ago about uh, MLG coming to TV. And, and he had a, a few fair points to make uh, about... Uh, he asked what I thought, and I said that with enough exposure, uh, I, I think that it would do well if you let MLG air out their tournaments for a long period of time, or a longer period of time than what happened before, then a lot more people would be more susceptible to it. And he came back and said, well, if you really want it to work, you need to do uh, media coverage for it beforehand. You need to, you know, months in advance say, hey, this is going to be on TV, all of you nerdy folk tune in. Uh, and all the people who are tuning into eSports now are doing it through Twitch anyway, so there's no need to go and turn on a TV when they can watch what they want to watch on Twitch. So it's it's uh, it's an interesting conversation. Well, I think what I, I do think that that actually would be helpful if they started to get that out to the TV media because there definitely are a lot of people who still watch TV and 
I'm going to be quite honest. When I think about the people who still watch TV, I'm thinking of probably older people. So, you know, people, you know, who have just been, uh, TV has been like, you know, the bee's knees for the past several decades. Meanwhile, like, you know, with like the internet being fairly new and advancing pretty damn fast. Um, stuff like MLG and uh, video games, they don't, they don't get out as much with these other audiences. And I'm not saying that um, um, what wasn't I saying? <laughs> I, I'm not saying that like uh, if, we're, if we're like trying to stream MLG or something, it's it's more like to raise awareness for like you know video gaming is a thing that's done professionally because as a form of media, because I really feel that's closer to what video games should be described as, not just as games. But, you know, because video games are, quite honestly, a large part of uh, consumer life today. It's true. Well, it's, it's a lot more interactive than sitting and watching, you know, two episodes of NCIS or Law & Order. You're spending two hours exactly. sitting there doing nothing but watching TV and playing video games for two hours. You're engaged mentally and, you know, your hand-eye coordination is being engaged. Uh, the article says, I wonder if MLG touched the sides... As it slid down Activision's, oh, uh, capacious gullet with barely a squeak. The ailing esports firm has become part of a publishing behemoth in a takeover deal worth $46 million cash. Or rather, MLG continues to operate as MLG, but Activision has acquired the bulk of its assets and associated liabilities. As part of the deal, CEO Sundance DiGiovanni has been ousted and replaced with former MLG CFO Greg Chisholm. Minority shareholders are a little upset about the deal because nobody bothered to consult them. Who cares? Uh, nothing's being done with MLG. It's a property that's just kind of sitting there. And if Activision slash Blizzard thinks they can do something with it, more power to them. All right. Suspicions are that much of the money will go towards relieving MLG's $6 million debt. As opposed to investors' packets, Esports Observer reported a poignant quote from one such individual, uh, I got fucked on stock. In less corporate terms, I see consequences, consequences for esports already. MLG's fortunes took their most visible dive when ESL was awarded the Call of Duty World League in preference. But of course, Acta Blizzard owns Call of Duty, and it owns StarCraft and Overwatch. It's hard to imagine them on show anywhere other than Activision's new-grown $46 million esports arm. Activision has released a statement confirming its acquisition of MLG. Our acquisition of Major League Gaming's business furthers our plan to create the EAS... It's sorry, the ESPN of esports. MLG's ability to create premium content and its proven broadcast technology platform, including its live streaming capability, strengthens our strategy, strategic position in competitive gaming. MLG <coughs> has an incredibly strong and seasoned team and a thriving community. Together, we will create new ways to celebrate players and their unique skills, dedication, and commitment to gaming. We are excited to add Sundance and the entire MLG esports team to our competitive gaming initiatives. Suggest that Giovanni is still MLG in some capacity. A PR firm working for Activision has supplied a quote from Di Giovanni regarding the role. I'm not going anywhere and am thrilled to join Activision Blizzard. This is a huge opportunity to help shape the future of esports, and I'm excited to be a part of it along with the esports team at MLG. Bigger and better things are in store for the MLG business, our partners, and our community. So they're expecting some, some pretty heavy things coming down the pipe, and so am I. I mean, you have one of the biggest names in gaming, Activision Blizzard, doing a thing. I mean, uh, yeah, you, you can't it's, lose. <coughs> well, I mean, you could, but in this situation, it definitely doesn't look like they're going. Well, uh, as, as Bob so eloquently put, uh, there's Parker. 
Blizzard has the ability to print its own money with World of Warcraft. Their pockets are so deep, spending $46 million on MLG is pocket change to them. And it doesn't matter what they do with it, it's, I mean, it's an attempt, right? And they're going to they're gonna do something with it, and then they're probably going to screw up and they're going to do something else. But this also raises the question, and Bob and I also discussed this, what about all the MLG memes you see on YouTube and Twitch where people are making fun of MLG? If Activision Blizzard are serious about this new property they've acquired, they are going to make sure that people take it seriously, which means you cannot... You, there's a good possibility you're not going to be able to use their logos for for sarcasm or memes anymore because it's 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 now an owned and protected property. From a legal standpoint, it makes sense to tell people not to use the logo without your consent. Well, that is true, but we also do need to realize that they are going to have. I mean, this is the. They're going to want to try and appeal, of course, more to that internet society because that's where a lot of the MLG comes from. And that internet society, you know, I mean, if I was an MLG, I would still love those memes and those, you know, things that sort of make fun of it because it's funny. Oh, and it's free advertising too. Yeah, exactly. True. So I would think it would be a wise move if Activision, you know, didn't do anything of the sort, but instead just, you know, kind of embraced it because it's part of like, it's part of the internet culture to make memes and to make, you know, stuff that's making fun of stuff. I mean, hell, I want to, I feel like stuff from like, you know, Skyrim and other video games that just got those memes out. Skyrim had like shit ton. You know, I feel that that only aided those communities and, you know, the people who made those games because, you know, again, that's like free advertising. And, you know, who doesn't love, like, actually laughing at a bit of content? Right. Everyone loves to laugh. MLG 360 so, No Scope. So even if your stuff is making people laugh, even if it's not even intentional, that's definitely something you can cash in on. Right. It is. But from, a, from like, a, a legal standpoint, right? If, if the lawyers for Activision Blizzard think that it is a detriment to that, to that brand, if it's a detriment to that tag then there's going to be some some pretty heavy uh, blowback for all of the people using MLG as a joke. And that, I mean, that's just from a legal perspective. I understand it from like an advertising perspective. It's genius. You let the viral marketing or the meme marketing take care of itself. Your name will get literally everywhere. Your name will get everywhere. And I mean, at that point, you're not even paying for advertising because people are making MLG memes and having these these weird smoke weed every day, air horn, Doritos, Mountain Dew, whatever, all over the place, and it's funny. But people will know MLG. Of course, it won't be taken seriously, uh, at least not until they do something massive or big with the MLG name. But until then, let I mean, let the virus continue to spread. Yeah, I definitely say. It would be the, the smartest move on their end, e even even given all the legal jargon. The smartest move on their end is definitely to let it be and just let let the internet and the community do with it what they will. I agree. So, have you played or seen anything from Rainbow Six Siege? Me? Yes, you. I do not believe so. I actually been meaning to since I did buy a whole bunch of Tom Clancy shit off of uh, the Humble Bundle. Yeah, I, I've been a big fan of everything Tom Clancy for a really long, really long time. Uh, between the books and the games and and everything of the nature, uh, it was it was easy for me to want to play Rainbow Six Siege. And a lot of people really like the game when they have people to play with. But for me, I see a Tom Clancy game or a game with a Tom Clancy name on it that doesn't have a story, and it makes me a little sad. Like, Tom Clancy has has just recently passed away. He's just recently died. And the next game that you release is nothing that does any kind of a hat tip or any kind of a, a show respect to the man. You, you create what equates to a highly tactical counter-strike, and people are probably going to slap the shit out of me for saying it. But you, you don't have a, a, a story-driven game in a Tom Clancy game. And that's, I mean, that's, that's really sad. Of course, I'm really happy for The Division and the next Ghost Recon game coming out. Uh, 
Wildlands, and I'm super stoked and super psyched for super psyched for both of those. But I I, I don't think eh, you didn't need to put the Tom Clancy name on it, at least in my opinion. And I know it's based on his intellectual property, and I know that the Rainbow Six name is something that sells relatively well. But you could have named it maybe anything, anything else, and had just as much of a happy reception from people who played it. Um, but well, the reason I bring this up is that uh, some of the the preliminary artwork, uh, some of the, sorry, concept art for DLC was leaked, and it looks like there is a frozen yacht, a frozen over yacht that you'll have the ability to play on for uh, for a future map, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's that, that's freaking awesome. That does sound pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I can't speak. I can't speak too much personally about Tom Clancy. Uh, as I said, I haven't played any of the games. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about the man. Um, so I'm going to take your word for it that the story thing in a Tom Clancy game is fairly vital. You know, now that I think about it, I think that having the the players of that game. Uh, experiencing or living or playing their own story in a versus game is kind of a big deal. You have the players telling the story of what they experienced in a particular match, in one particular match or another, and that I mean it's it's a combat experience. That's uh, that's that's it's a it's a rush. It's a you know one versus the other. Whether you're talking about the oh, yeah. the the terrorists or the counter terrorists, chuckle chuckle, but. Oh, I- <laughs> How long ago did Tom Clancy actually die? Oh God. Uh, Rough estimate: one, two, five. October first, two thousand thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Okay. Yep. And this game released during the twenty fifteen time, didn't it? Uh, let me see here. Oh, I can see you pulling all that stuff up on the screen. Yep. Uh, twenty fifteen. So, two years after he died. Okay, but, so I don't think it's... I don't think it's terribly... Uh, hey, what's up, Rad Man? Welcome. Welcome to the party, gangsta. Yo, Rad. I don't think it's terribly, like, you know, out of thought that it could have been in development or could have been an idea. Of course, two years, that that is giving out a lot of time for things to change about the game, so... It's definitely questionable about how much of it is Tom Clancy's original vision. Uh, then you know, who knows? Maybe that was his original idea that they make the story because. Well, it's like, based on his universe, but I, I I don't know how much of if input he actually has on the games that are being made, or, and and devil's advocate here, if his focus or the 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 development company's focus on the game was to make the division or to make. Uh, Ghost Recon, uh, Wildlands, and Tom Clancy died, maybe the development team focused their attention on that instead of Siege. Maybe. I mean, I, I there's a, a million different reasons this could be, but I don't see the purpose of a Tom Clancy game without a story. And that, I mean, that's just me. That, is, that, that doesn't mean I, I won't enjoy the game if and or when I play it. It just means that I'm going to look at it with a slightly skewed point of view because I had respect for the writer before having respect for the games. Now, Tom Clancy, was he? Did he actually have any military involvement? Was he an ex-cop? Yes. Or... Yes, former military, and okay. he his the, his writing style was. <coughs> I actually got a lot of my writing cues from him in regards to combat, and I'm sure you are familiar with the way I write combat. It's all very detailed and visceral, and and point A to point B, and very direct at the same time. But he did that with firearms and troop movements and, and you know, physical movements of people stacking up on doors and, and, and breaching through a door and clearing the room. Like, that was that was his style of writing. And everything else, he was okay with, like, dialogue and plot development. Um, Hunt for Red October is based on a book of his. Uh, the Sum of All Fears is based on a book of his. The, the movies that came out. Based on books from him? Yes. Damn. There are a lot of movies that, that took influences from his work, and just how visceral the combat he wrote was, That uh, again, that's that's where I get 
a lot of my cues in writing combat was from this guy, and he was spot on. And it was, it was, there's a lot of technical information that might bore somebody who really isn't into that, but uh, my dad, who is a former Marine, reads his books and he can visualize all the weapons and the mechanics and everything going on in his head because he's been there, he's done that. Uh, and, and for myself, I've I've practiced with a bit of gunplay myself, nothing like clearing a room or or shooting at people who are shooting at me. But uh, it's it's it was a unique style of writing in regards to the combat that I I've never seen before in any other book I've ever read. He was a, a very unique author. Um, I so I, I don't know how many cues they got from him or how many ideas they got from him for Siege. So I, I don't... I'm judging a book by its cover again, and I shouldn't do that. Of course, I did play during the free weekend. I played a game, and I really wanted to like the game. I really went into it looking like, hey, maybe this is something I will enjoy. And I played a game, and I thought there are a lot of really complex mechanics that could be really fun with multiple people playing the game at the same time. But I was by myself. I was on a team with myself and some other random friggin' people against other random friggin' people, and it was just kinda, I couldn't be tactical because I don't want to talk to people I don't like. No, dude. Okay. So, well, um, hmm? well, Parker is here, and he hasn't said a damn word yet, either that or he's not. That's because he's doing some stuff, and he'll end up oh. missing something if we try to talk to him, so don't. Don't say anything, just pretend he's not here. He's like a, he's like a Tyrannosaurus. If you don't move, he won't see you. God. God. So maybe I'll give I'll give Siege another once over. Maybe I'll I'll take the plunge and buy it and throw down with uh, some some other streamers, maybe with just a couple of friends and see whether or not Dude. I like it. I know that I'm going to be all over the division when it comes out, and I'm going to play that like a crack fiend uh, who was just given a year supply of free crack. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Your supply? You mean three days supply? Three, you mean three days. Did you watch the news video where I showed the uh, the the clip of the 1,000 Death Claws versus 10 Liberty Primes in Fallout uh, 4? I don't think I saw that one, but I've definitely seen a whole lot of shit that's basically the same damn thing. Okay, well, here's the news article from Kotaku. And let me get the actual video for it so that you can see it in all of its splendor. There it is. <laughs> Damn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's Did brutal. any of the Liberty Primes go down? Nope. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't think so because I noticed... I've seen sev through several things that... Uh, one, I don't know if Liberty Prime even has like life points because first off, he's like... He's a Basically mission immortal. Asset. Yeah, he's a mission asset. <coughs> so but there's mission assets can't die first. There's there's the video, and we're gonna we're gonna watch it again because it's awesome. So, uh, hang on to your butts. Hey, what's going on, guys? Ez here, back with another Fallout Four. It's five. like two minutes long. Um, this is gonna be ten Liberty Primes All right, against I'm gonna show up one thousand Death Claws. The stream volume. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and share it. Let the battle begin. Uh It's brutal. Okay. That's actually pretty interesting because 
I've actually seen in the past they've done things like what happens when you hit a behemoth versus a whole bunch of death claws, and the death claws will just run. There's something in their coding that says they will not take on a behemoth. They will run. Oh, you, from a you can change that code. You can change their their fortitude and their their courage, so you can make them attack anybody belonging to any faction. In this case, the super mutant or the behemoth class, and the death claws won't give a shit. Damn. Yep. That's something that you know someone needs to do because so far all the ones I've seen are super mutant behemoth versus death claws. Behemoths always win. Death claws. Oh, just run like the bitches. That's crazy. Yeah, all of them just got Tyrannosaurus wrecked. That is hilarious. That is a bit. It is. It is a little bit chuckle worthy. So did you? I, I saw you playing Fallout Four. Uh, what did you? What did you think of the game in general? What did you think? Well, I will say that given your given your viewpoint and the video that you've shown me recently, I can definitely agree with a lot of it. You know, it did feel rather samey, but I do feel that that was somewhat what they were going for. I felt like when they were creating the game, they were trying to make me sort of Fallout Three nostalgia. Because I gotta say, the moment. You know, I started hearing those old songs on the radio again, uh, even though they played on VT. And, you know, eventually I did turn over to classical radio, which I thought was also a nice new touch. You know, not terribly like they had to put a lot of effort into that, but still something nice, because I love my classical radio. Um, I forget where I was going with this. Something about nostalgia. <laughs> but yeah, they had a lot of the samey things. I I want to I want to find someone who isn't completely devastated, having played the past Fallout games, now having this new chat system that's like minimal. It's like this suddenly became Mass Effect. And I tried to well, even Mass Effect had dialogue choices uh, that impacted the the end story. Like Mass Effect had a a, a pseudo morality system. So true, true. the way you communicated uh, with people changed the way everyone looked at you. And Fallout 4, that wasn't the case at all. It, the way you spoke to people changed nothing about the story. And I, I think that's probably what bothered me the most. Yeah, there was yes, no, and sarcastic. Yep. And I, well, one of these days, I'm going to make a character that just... Anytime they can sarcastic, they will. And I want to see if that actually does do anything. But it won't. I know it won't. They... they that, that is something that they didn't do this time, where I have no idea why they didn't do it. And one of the things that specifically miffed me off the most about that was... They took away some of the reasons that I liked having maybe high intelligence characters, the characters with science perks. Because I remember in the old games, having those things, on rare occasion, but still on occasion, would give you dialogue options. And those dialogue options I always thought were like an interesting, cool touch to have. Because it's like... And then the responses really to those smart. dialogue options were, were pretty funny too. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes they were. I remember even hell, one time... In the for Fallout 3 Mothership Zeta, I had the Mysterious Stranger, and I found out that having the Mysterious Stranger perk actually even had a dialogue option once, and I was like, oh my god, they thought of everything. And there were just, you know, some times where it was just like the details of the game that were like, those were the awesome things about the game. Well, well here it's... Uh, it feels like a few more details are left out. Where they I think they put their focus them. on other things outside of the dialogue system. Like, I, I think they, they put some focus on polishing up the gunplay system. And I was I, 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 I was discussing this with Bob as well. The, the gunplay from Fallout 3 in New Vegas was polished up and made a lot more fluid. The guns felt better when you weren't shooting outside of VATS. And I know, you know, that's that's mostly skill-based, but even when you had terrible skills in Fallout 4, you still felt like you were in 
semi-control of where the gun was going, and it felt fluid and like it was moving, versus Fallout 3 in New Vegas, where it was kind of a jerky point to one area or another, and it made the game kind of frustrating. The gunplay felt good. I, I loved the, the, the shooter mechanics of Fallout 4, and I, I, I think they, they focused attention on making some things better, and they just kind of brushed some things off to the side, and that's not what I expect out of Bethesda. I expect them to to check every box on the way down, and if the, the removal of the, the enhanced or advanced dialogue system, or the involved dialogue system, was something that they had planned from the beginning, I don't know, man. That just, yeah. that just, that just bothers me. Like, was it your intention to, to butcher the dialogue system? Yeah, that's... It, it really, it's really gotten to a lot of players, I must say. Well, and, and I played through and I did the Institute story arc, and then I did the Brotherhood story arc, and I enjoyed the game for what it was. But I did notice what the game wasn't as well, and that's that. That's what broke it for me. That's what made the game a a disappointment for me. It wasn't that it's a bad game. It's good. I, I enjoyed the experience while I had it, but it isn't something I can see myself continuing to go back to over and over and over again because there didn't feel like there was enough choice or options. Um, there, there's no... You know, small difference in gameplay depending on how you do it. It's it's either one way or another or another or another, and there's there's no there's no real variable. I don't want to ruin it because I, I don't know who's watching who hasn't beaten the game. But for me, the ending of Fallout Four was reminiscent of the ending of Mass Effect 3. And if anybody's played Mass Effect 3, it basically boiled down to four choices in, in Mass Effect 3. Everything you've done in Mass Effect 1 that followed over to 2, everything from 2 that followed over to 3, everything in 3. So I spent 27 hours on the first one, 28 on the second, and like 19 or 20 on the third. And all of that time accumulated to four choices in the game. Either I could... Save the machines and kill the humans. Oh, spoilers, spoilers, man. What, what? Mass Effect? If you haven't beaten Mass Effect Three yet, dude, that game is old as shit. Fine, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, it came down. Mass, to... Effect is, Mass Effect is still on my hit list. Okay, well then I won't ruin it for you. But it comes down to four choices, and everything before that means nothing. That was the ending that pissed everyone off who had played Mass Effect. That is so, what so was... that's why that's why everyone was always so angry. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I still don't know how I've not gotten it spoiled, yeah. but yeah, I've definitely heard that lots of people were pissed at that end. Now the journey was was more important to me in that game than the destination. Like starting from the beginning of Mass Effect One and getting to the end of Mass Effect Three, that entire journey was worth more to me than that ending was. And I reloaded my, my save file to go and see the other ending, and reloaded to go and see the other one. And, eh, nah, no, I could see myself playing through 1, 2, and 3, and stopping before the end of 3, and just saying, meh, that's the end for me. And I'd be fine with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. Yeah, okay. So, the game's good. Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, amazing games. The ending might piss you off. But the games themselves are good. They are they are worth playing. Completely worth playing. I still recommend and, everybody play Mass Effect Trilogy. All of them. And as this game goes, it's... Would I be spoiling it if I said it's pretty much the same ending? Like, what happens in game is different, but like the ending is pretty much the same, isn't it? Is there literally anything different about the ending, no matter which... Based on what you do, no. There is no difference in those four endings, depending on your choices in the, the, the three previous games. Your choices up to that point mean nothing. Actually, I will say for note, there is a fifth ending, but it's just completely douchebag. But you can activate the ending via that... via fifth way. Oh, what you mean? Turning and pointing your gun at the hologram? Hologram? You, when you beat Mass Effect 3, you know exactly what I mean. Don't shoot the kid. That's all I'm going to say. That is not a good idea. Well, I'm not talking about Mass Effect. I'm talking about 
Fallout. Oh, Fallout? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the journey through the story in, in Fallout 4 was the, the, the big selling point for me when I did play it, is what I enjoyed most about it being the story, going from the beginning to the very end. And the story itself, like, the end of it really wasn't satisfying for me, but the path to get there was really kind of cool. Like, if I wanted to, to, and I butchered the railroad. I butchered them. The first time I met them, they were pretentious dicks, so I did a little whatever. The second time I went through, the first time I got introduced to them, I, pu I, I pulled out my Gatling gun and just laid them all out. It was, it was done. I was, I just scrubbed them off the face of the earth, and I was finished with them. You, di you didn't even, like, listen. Nope, don't give a fuck. You all get to die. You're all shitty motherfuckers, die. Yeah, no, no, you all think you're human, you all get to die. Oh, look, they think they're people. <laughs> well, let's make them meet. Like, like... Pretty much. Well, wow, dude, we've actually been at this for an hour, that's kinda cool. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So you're having a conversation about the news stories I covered previously in the week. The first being Valve's apology for the Steam Christmas sale troubles. The second being Activision Blizzard's acquisition of MLG for $46 million. The third being Rainbow Six Siege's possible Frozen Over Yacht DLC map. And the fourth being the amazing Thousand Death Claw vs. Ten Liberty Prime Battle on YouTube. All of the links are in the chat. Also in Discord in the start, in the press start text chat channel if you want to see it we are going to take a short five minute break and be back with cards against humanity thank you guys for being awesome you to be awesome we'll be right back after this short break cheers Woo!